Hi everyone and welcome to our first virtual field trip of June. I'm Laura and I'll be your moderator today. In a minute we'll join Archbold Director of Education Dustin Angel, but first I'll share some guidelines for navigating the Zoom webinar. All participants are muted and your video cameras are turned off. You may submit your questions using the Q&A button along the bottom of the screen for our panelists to answer after the lecture. Use the chat button to communicate with panelists and attendees. Make sure that you choose all panelists and attendees so everyone will see your comment. Today, Dustin's taking us for a walk in the Florida scrub. So let's see what's happening. Welcome everybody out here to the beautiful Florida scrub with me at Archbold Biological Station. I really do want to say thank you and welcome for joining me taking part of your morning to visit the scrub, but a special welcome goes out to all our virtual summer campers. Right now we have seven to 12 year olds that are at home exploring the nature and science in their own backyards. And then this part on Tuesdays is the field trip portion. So hopefully we've got a whole bunch of summer campers logged on right now. Everybody, please put your name and where you're coming from so we can see where people uh, are. I know, I'm sure we have people from Florida on today, but our campers are from Maine, Washington, Georgia, Florida, all over the place. So write it in the chat where you're coming from. You may have never visited before, so I'm glad you can do this. Hopefully you get a chance to come out here later and you and I can come out on the trail together. So real quick, if you don't know what Archbold is, it's a biological field station. Basically that means it's a big nature preserve for researchers and students to come out here and learn about nature. We're nonprofits. Our mission is to build and share the scientific knowledge needed to protect the life, lands, and waters in the heart of Florida and beyond. When Archbold, when Richard Archbold started this back in 1941, there were two million people living in Florida. Only two million. Today we have 21 million people in Florida. That's a lot of people. And we get over a hundred million visitors each year. So Florida didn't get any bigger. We got a whole lot more people coming here and living here. So that means that places like Archbold, these nature preserves are really important for protecting nature. But field stations play a special role because not only do they protect nature, but they give us the science to help make good decisions about protecting nature, not just on our property, but on other parts around Florida. Well, let's get to it. I'm gonna turn my camera around so you can uh, see what I'm seeing, a beautiful view right here. And I'd like you to use the chat again. Tell me what you are seeing. How would you describe this landscape? Maybe you're somewhere out west and you've got the Rocky Mountains out your back door. And you're thinking, whoa, this looks very different. Is this what you think of when you think of Florida? How would you describe this kind of Florida scrub habitat? I see a lot of people saying, yeah, it looks like you got scrub there. But how do you describe scrubs you've never seen? Oh, Heidi, I love that. Few trees. It's very open. Nice. When people think of Florida, I, I think they think about palm trees. Do you see any palm trees out here? We've got no palm trees out here. Uh, but if I look down right here, it looks like someone took a palm tree and crushed it into the ground. This one is a palmetto. We have two kinds of palmetto out here. This is a scrub palmetto. We also have saw palmetto. I'll show you one of those in a minute. 
But if you're ever wondering the difference between the two, there's a couple easy ways to tell. These little hairs, these fibers on here, that's the dead giveaway, lets you know that that one is a scrub palmetto. Also see this little spine, that lets you know that that's a scrub palmetto. And if I turn just a little bit here, there we go, right there is a saw palmetto. We come a little closer. Oh, look, we've got a spider. I don't know if you'll be able to see it on here, but we've got a spider here. And the saw palmettos, they do not have those hairs and they don't have the spine. They, but what, what they do have are all these ja little jagged edges here. And uh, when you're walking through here, you need to have pants on because those spines will cut you up pretty bad. It's really easy to get, to get cut up on the saw palmetto. So hopefully you're looking around thinking, wow, yeah, the scrub is a little different. Maybe not what I expected Florida to look like. So let's take a closer look at some of the things that are around here. By closer look, I actually mean a closer look because I have a little macro lens that I can attach to my phone right here. So I'm gonna go around and look at some of the flowers that are blooming right now, and maybe look at some of the other things too, and uh, get a real close look at it. First thing I wanna get closer to are some of these beautiful white flowers. They're all kind of all around me, but there's some over here I'm gonna take a look at. If you know what this is, then tell, tell us in the chat. Here we go. If you know what kind of flower that is, tell us in the chat. Right now, these are blooming everywhere. If you're walking out in the, in the scrub here, uh, they, they pop out because the scrub is pretty, you know, pretty green with that white sand. And then these white flowers just really pop out. Very good, we have a few people who, who know what this is. It's a tar flower, very nice. I'm going to put my lens on here. Then I'll switch over my camera and we'll get up close. Here we can see, beautiful. The tar flower gets its name because it's really sticky. Um, if I touch, let me, get, let me get another one in focus for us here. Sorry, where is it? There we go. <laughs> if I touch the buds behind the flower, they're very sticky. And yeah, right behind the flower petals at the base there is very sticky. We have a, an intern who's researching the tar flowers right now trying to understand what that stickiness is about. Now, many of us, us have come out here and we have seen insects stuck on these. You'll see insects that are, that are dead on here. And what you would assume is that, yeah, my sunglasses did fall off. <laughs> what you would assume is that um, this is trying to protect itself from insects somehow. Is it trying to protect against insects that are, would kill the plant? Or maybe insects that are trying to steal the pollen and nectar? The, what, what Lily is doing is she's taking sand, plenty of sand out here, and sprinkling sand on the sticky parts. So that way they can't trap insects. And then watching to see what the insects actually do with this flower. She doesn't have her results yet, but if you stay tuned to Archbold's calendar, when she's done with her project, she'll do a presentation for us. I just love these. Perhaps my favorite flower on this trail right here is in front of me. And this one you do have to get low down on the ground for. These little, these little yellow flowers. I, oh, look, some people already know them. 
I like these ones. Uh, well, one, for one, they're pretty. But for two, the scientific name is really fun because it sounds like a spell from Harry Potter. It's called Hypericum Reductum. <laughs> and you can see Reductum sounds like it's small, right? Because it's a small flower. Hypericum Reductum. And I imagine Harry Potter uh, waving his wand and shrinking these down really small. We have 10 different species of hypericum. And if you don't know that scientific name, you may have heard them called St. John's warts. A lot of people have heard of St. John's warts because they are used in medicine. Actually, that name wart is kind of a weird name. If a plant has a name wart in it, then it was probably used for medicine at some time in the past. St. John's wort's been used for medicine for literally thousands of years. You do need to be careful though, because if, you're, if you go and get some St. John's wort tea and you're taking other medications, it can have really bad side effects. So don't just go out and start taking it. It can be potent stuff. Let's put on, oh, I've already got my lens on there. I'm gonna switch over and look up close. Let's get one in focus here. Let's see, here we go. That looks a little blurry still. There we go. They're very pretty little tiny flowers. See if I can get another one in focus for you. Come right down here. There we go, yes. Beautiful, beautiful little flower. Now and this macro lens only costs about $30, which, you know, when you're talking about photography is pretty good. Photography equipment gets very expensive. Let me switch back around. <laughs> I know it takes it a few seconds to switch back over and sorry that it's blurry. I'm gonna try putting my glasses on again. We'll see if they don't fall off again. <laughs> there's there's one other plant over here that I want to show you. This one is not a flower. Well, it has a flower, but I I don't see them blooming yet. Uh it's a vine. And I'll put the I'll put the little macro lens on in a minute. I don't know if you can see it with this. I want you to see that there's a little vine going across here. It has, it has thorns on it, so you gotta be careful. It does get a very pretty pink flower on it. Right now, it doesn't have the flower on it, but it does have a very pretty flower. I'm gonna switch my camera to my macro lens and see if I can get this in focus. Okay, coming in. There's the spines. You can see all those thorns. Here, these little leaves. I wonder if anybody knows what these are. Get it in focus for you. There we go. This is a mimosa. Hey, very good. You see, you got it right as I was saying it. And watch what happens when I touch just a little bit touch this mimosa, I'd be able to see it actually closing up its leaves. I'll try again to get another one in focus. Right on the top here. Oh, where'd it go? There it is. Oh, I think I hit it with my camera and it already, it already closed up. Let's see. Here we go. These ones haven't closed quite yet. And if I get my finger in there and just touch them a little bit, Oh, there you go. Wow, there it goes. They close right up saying, hey, don't eat me. Don't look at me. It's going to close right up and rely on, uh, rely on its thorns to keep it safe. When these are blooming during the summer, they're really pretty. Pink balls. So we've talked a little bit about some of the things that are blooming out here and some of the cool plants that are out in the scrub. Uh, but we haven't talked about the sand. And 
I have a little video clip we'll pop on right now. We have a couple of clips that we're going to show you. We have three clips. Um, bear with us if it takes it, you know, a few seconds for the video to, to start playing. Uh, but this will go into where did this sand come from? This sugar white sand resembles a sandy beach, right? Well, this area used to be a beach. Wait, what's a beach doing in the middle of Florida? Two million years ago, and even more recently, the sea levels were much higher than today. Perched above the sea were these sandy islands of Florida scrub. Go for a walk or drive around. You'll appreciate the hilly landscape of the Florida scrub. These hills are the tops and bottoms of ancient coastal sand dunes. Today, sea levels are much lower. The modern coastline is far away. Much of Florida is flat, low-lying, and wet, but the Florida scrub stays relatively high and dry on these sandy ridges. Archbold sits on a large inland ridge called the Lake Wales Ridge. The Lake Wales Ridge is 116 miles long, extending down the middle of Florida from Orlando south to Archbold and Lake Placid. The Florida scrub. So we are on an ancient island, and it, it does feel like you're at the beach. If you ever go to some of the beaches in Florida, like maybe you've been to, um, or, or go to the coast like Merritt Island, you'll see that there's scrub right on the coast too, on the sand dunes out there. It's the same thing we've got here. I like to imagine I'm in a time machine going back, and if I was standing right here, the ocean would be just a few miles in, both of the, in all three of these directions. But then north, it would be something like 115 miles, just this long, skinny island going up that way. Uh, about 3 million years ago, geologists think that the ocean was about 100 feet deeper than it is today. That ocean rises up, and we're high and dry right here. That makes this a very old habitat. If you go down to the Everglades, further south, like to the Everglades National Park, the south part of Florida, that habitat is, is amazing, beautiful, diverse, but it's not that old. It's only around 6,000 years old, which is incredible when you think about it. And I'm from up in New York originally, which was covered by ice until around 10,000 years ago. So the habitats that are up there have only been there since the last ice age. Here in the middle of the state is this ancient, ancient landscape habitat that has been here for millions of years, which is pretty cool. <laughs> so it's so the video talked about sand. I'm gonna actually um, put a little bit of sand on my finger and, and put it up to the magnifying lens so you can really see uh, why they call this sugar sand. So we'll be we'll be uh, blurry for a second here, and then I'll get you some sand. Okay. There we go. Get that in focus. I just, I just uh, put my finger, you know, on the ground for a second there, and there's the sugar sand. I mean, it, it really, really looks like sugar. You notice that we don't see bits of shell in there, bits of rock in there, just this pure sand. It is just ground up uh, quartz, essentially, and it came from the southern, Appala uh, the southern Appalachian Mountains. It took a long time to end up down here, but just think of the slow erosion of the mountaintops. The Appalachians used to have pointy peaks a long, long time ago and slowly eroded. And that's where some of the beautiful white beaches in Florida come from. But some of that sand ended up in the middle of the state too. Now that we've talked a little bit about uh, the, the structure of what's out here in terms of, you know, not a lot of trees, short trees, lots of sand, now you're going to be a scrub expert. And the next time you go out with your friends, you can say to them, 
I know how to tell if I'm in the Florida scrub. There's three questions you can answer if you're in the Florida scrub and you can pre impress your friends with this. Number one, am I in Florida? Okay, that's, that's an easy one. Uh, but it's, it bears saying because that's pretty cool. You've got to be in Florida here uh, to have Florida scrub. So if you're in South Carolina, sorry, you don't have any Florida scrub. Number two, do I have the sugar sand? Yes, I've definitely got it right here, obviously. Number three, are there any scrub oak trees around? And I can say yes to that. We have four different kinds of scrub oaks. And I'm, I'm gonna show you one of them right behind me. Actually, I've got a couple of them. On, I've got them on both sides of me. Uh, and you might think, how does anything survive? Why isn't it just a desert out here? That sand doesn't have much nutrients. When it rains, the water is gonna just you know, go right down into that sand. It's not gonna hold on to it. So how do things survive? Well, life finds a way and it adapts. This is the first plant that I learned when I moved to Florida seven years ago, and it's the sand live oak tree. Sand live oak, it looks very similar to the live oaks. And if you ever picture the south, uh, the southeast, you might imagine big live oak trees with Spanish moss hanging on them. These uh, are kind of a, a scraggly looking <laughs> version of those. Uh, and usually in the scrub, they're pretty small, but they can get tall too. You notice that the leaves are pretty small here. And if you got close and looked up to all these plants around, you would notice that most of them have small leaves. This is to do something very special that helps them survive. If you know what it is, type it in the chat. Why would it be helpful to have small leaves to survive in the scrub? How could that help? It's hot out here. There's not much, um, you know, there's not much water in the soil. Right now, it's, I think it's about 85 degrees. Hey, very good. Yep, to hold on to its water, to have uh, less of the water evaporate out of it. In fact, I'm going to show you, um, I'm going to zoom in on the underside of the leaf because an easy way to tell the difference between whether this is a live oak or a sand live oak, is to see the little hairs that are on the bottom of the leaf. And if we're lucky, my magnifying lens will let us see this. Here we go. I'm gonna zoom in here. Move my lens a little bit. There we go. There's the bottom of our leaf there. And it is fuzzy, a little fuzzy. Hair. It's going in and out of focus, but maybe you can see it. Little hairs, a whole bunch of little hairs right there. And what these are doing is they're, they're basically a windbreaker to keep the air from evaporating the water out of the bottom of this. There's little holes called stomata on the bottom of, of leaves, and those little holes are how the how the um, leaf breathes. So imagine if you walked around in the heat all day with your mouth open. It's not gonna take too long until you get uh, you know, a pretty dry mouth. But if you have, uh, maybe if you've got a big beard, <laughs> a big mustache covering your face, or you're wearing, you're wearing some protection over your mouth, uh, your mouth's gonna stay nice and moist. <laughs> so that's what these are doing. They got the little hairs on there, helping to keep their water in. There's, there's one other oak I'll show you here. Remember I said there's four kinds, but I'm just gonna show you two of them. This one often gets called scrub oak. We um, at Archbold, a lot of times we'll call it Archbold oak because it was here that this was shown to be its own species. You might notice that the leaves are doing something a little bit funky. It looks like there's a blow dryer under here blowing all the leaves up. They're curling and pointing straight up. They're also small. They're also waxy. Well, I forgot to mention that with the other, with the other one, but the, 
the leaves on all four of these are either they're real waxy um, or just you know, like pretty hard um, to hold that water in. By pointing up like that, when the sun is real high in the sky uh, in, the, in the afternoon, it's going to um, change its uh, angle to the sun and help keep this uh, a little cooler so the sun's rays aren't directly on the leaves. These are pretty darn cool. They're only found in the Florida scrub. I brought something with me. I brought a little tool. Handy dandy spoon. <laughs> and I've never been with me on tour out here. Uh, sometimes people notice I'll have a spoon in my pocket. Now, what is that for? Oh, it's for all kinds of things. So let's take another look at the sand below here. Got this white sand, but I'm just gonna scoop it up a little bit and see what, what it looks like. See if we notice anything. What do you notice about the sand as I start, oops, I start digging it up here? Do you notice any difference in the sand underneath? Well, I can feel it's a little bit moisture. It's been raining a lot lately, but I'm also noticing there's a very different color underneath the sand here. And if you, yes, it's dark, right? And I was, and I just got through saying, it's sugar sand, you know, there's nothing in there. It's all white and there's hardly any nutrients. So where, where is the dark coming from? There, there are nutrients in there because something happens out here in the ecosystem here. What do you think is making that dark color in the sand? <laughs> decayed matter? It's not decayed matter. That, that's what you would think, right? Okay, I'm gonna give you a hint. Florida is the lightning strike capital of North America. Someone, yeah, there we go. Somebody got it, said fire. Before we had all of our roads and houses here in Florida and all the ditches and all of that, lightning would strike and sometimes fires would start and they would spread around, right? Not just in the scrub, but most of the parts of Florida, most of the habitats, most of the land in Florida is uh, adapted for fire. In fact, it's so adapted to it that it requires fire, just like rain. You know, you, you, it's got, uh, you don't want too little, you don't want too much, but it needs fire out here, which seems kind of like, you know, it doesn't make sense because why would you want to burn down your forest to help it? We've got, <laughs> we've got another clip we're going to pop up and it actually will show you uh, an area burning down and then you can watch as the fire or as the plants come back after a fire so you can see how quickly this all regenerates out there so we're going to get this clip up uh, and i should say thank you to into nature films who made both of these who burrow into the sand or use tortoise burrows to escape the fire Scrub plants like oaks and palmettos store everything vital below ground in massive storage organs, roots, and rhizomes. Below ground, fire can't do much to you. Heat dies quickly on the surface of the ground, rapidly cooling in the dense sugar sand. Research at Archbold showed 80% of the palmetto is subterranean. Fire consumes the above ground vegetation, but fire does not kill these plants. Within weeks after a fire, palmettos and oaks rise again out of the black. We call them resprouters. Resprouters use nutrients left by the fire to help produce new green shoots. In nature's big picture, this is a small setback. By burying temperature data loggers in the sand right before a fire, we can study the relationship between fire temperature and the survival and growth of the resprouters.
We have found that oaks and palmettos are resilient to a range of fire frequencies and intensities. They can tolerate temperatures up to 1,000 degrees Celsius. That's hot. After fire, resprouting plants grow rapidly. And by six months or a year, they look pretty much the same as they did before the fire. So resprouters don't experience a population explosion like the reseeders. They are more or less in the same place and the same size before and after fire. Fire stimulates flowering for many resprouters, especially Palafoxia fei and palmettos. Now that's just a little part of the video about fire. And I highly recommend checking out Archbold's YouTube page. Both of those clips were from films that Archbold made with Into Nature Films. And uh, Jen Brown runs that and she does an awesome job. So check out, we've got a whole bunch of videos on there. I just got through talking about how dry it is and how it's kind of like a desert out here. But as the video was on, I just took a very quick short little walk here and now I'm going to show you my feet. I want to see if you see any sand right here. <laughs> so obviously something's going on here. <laughs> I was just talking about how the scrub is so dry and these plants have to learn to deal with it. Uh, but here's the thing, dotted all out here uh, Archbold has around 9,000 acres of scrub on this property. We have hundreds of little seasonal ponds like this. Actually, some of them are pretty big. We have hundreds of these seasonal ponds. Uh, the rainy season has just started. Yes, yeah, some people call them ephemeral ponds. The rainy season has just started. So these ponds are filling up. They are the areas out here where the elevation just dips a little bit, dips a little bit, and the water... Uh, stays here. You'll actually notice that around me are, this is a whole different habitat. I'm not in the scrub, even though the scrub is just, you know, right at the edge there, uh, about a 30 second walk that way. Or vernal pools, yeah, another name for them. Uh, one of the things about Florida habitats to keep in mind is their mosaics. So in one walk, you might be in the scrub, then in a pond, then in a, and then in a pine forest, uh, or in a prairie. And they're all, they're all, you know, going back and forth between each other, which is, which is pretty cool. Uh, I want to show you one more flower here. Get down. This is a yellow milkwort. And yeah, it's called a milkwort. So my guess is that it was used for medicine at some point, but I don't know the history on the, on the milkwort. Uh, oh, and I guess I will show you one more. These are pretty meadow beauties down in the water. Those are really pretty too, the meadow beauties. I'm gonna put my lens on here again, see if I can get this meadow beauty in focus. There we go. Beautiful. And let's do this yellow milkwort here too. Nice. Oh, I just saw, uh, I just saw in the chat, someone said, uh, Bill Smith said, they were called milkworts because it was believed they increased the milk production from cows. If cows were eating them, wow. I wonder, if the, I wonder if they do or not. That's pretty cool. I've got one more little video we're gonna play. Um, before we play, I wanna say thank you again. After the video is over, I will be sticking around here for questions and answers. So if you haven't put any questions in the chat or in the Q&A area yet, add your questions. But thank you very much for being out here. It shows a lot that you are spending your time to learn a little bit more about Florida's habitats. Then we'll pull up this uh, quick 
uh, thank you video. This is from our entomologist, Dr. Mark Dara. So when you look out over the sandy world that's so special, you need to know that something much less special could have happened here. It could have been a strip mall or a golf course, something we already have a lot of. The only reason that that didn't happen is because special people protected and supported this unusual place. So on behalf of all the organisms that live here in a special place, thank you. Of course, you're not gonna get a thank you note from all the plants and animals that live here. But they can repay you and all of us, really, just by their existence and perhaps by sharing with us some of their secrets of survival. Well, thank you all again for hopping on here. I'll stay around for maybe another 15 minutes if, if people have questions. We've got our campers on, like I said before, but I know we have adults on and some of the people who watch these uh, are researchers in the field too. So I, I recommend sticking around because we get all kinds of really interesting questions. I'll do my best to answer them, but if there's some that I don't know, we will try to contact some of the researchers and get some answers for you um, and send out an email to everybody who registered on our Zoom. Um, if you haven't registered, you can still go to our website and register so that way you get the, get the email. Okay, uh, I haven't looked at the Q&A yet. Laura, are there any questions that, that we got here? You wanna feed me a couple of them? Yes, you do have a question from Ellen. She asked when you were looking at the tar flower, is the tar flower in any way parasitic? Parasitic, uh, not, that I, not that I know of. Um, here's the tar flower right here again. I haven't seen anything about this, I don't think so. There is, a, there is an interesting parasitic uh, plant that's out here that I hardly ever see. Um, it's called Indian pipe and Google it. Uh, the, the Latin name I think is monotropa. I only see it like once every two years and it's super weird because it doesn't it doesn't have chlorophyll in it. it. It doesn't photosynthesize because its roots connect into other plants and uh, can take the nutrients from them which is really cool. Uh, I would definitely show you one if I had one right here. <laughs> Excellent. And Bill asked about your macro lens. Where did you get your macro lens? Well, you know, I ordered, here it is right here. Uh, the brand, I ordered it on uh, Amazon, but the brand is uh, Zenvo, X-E-N-V-O. Yep, I see and it there I on your really... lanyard too. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, there you go. Uh, yeah. I highly recommend it. I, I got it about a week or so ago and it's been really fun. Uh, it actually is two lenses in one. I left the other part at the learning center, but it has another lens that you screw on here and you can have wide angle. So um, if you wanna have nice landscape pictures or video, you stick that on for that. But you can see it actually works pretty well, the, the macro part too. Um, I've been playing around taking pictures with it. And of course it's not as good as a professional camera, but cell phones now are really pretty darn good. Good question. <laughs> Thanks, nice. I have a question from Facebook from Armando. What is the range of the Archbald Oak? Okay, gotcha. Um, actually, before we go to that one, just one more thing about photography. This Thursday, three of us that are photographers that are at Archbald are giving a seminar Thursday at 3.30. One of the talks is about cell phone photography. Dr. Reed Bowman, our scrub jay specialist, the director of the avian ecology lab, he gets fantastic cell phone pictures. So he's gonna do 15 minutes on that. I'm gonna talk about wide angle. And then the other guy, Bill Parkin, is going to talk about 
photographing the ugly things in nature like uh, people's litter and how to tell that story and why that's important in photography. Okay, so there's just a little plug there for, for Thursdays. Um, the I'm not sure the full range. Here's the Inapina right here. It is, you know, I, I used to think that it was only in on the Lake Wales Ridge, uh, but that's not true. It's, it's common here in the scrub, but there have been records from other parts of Florida too, other, other counties that aren't, that aren't on the ridge. Um, but if you want to find it, come to Archbold, it, it's all over the place here. <laughs> Great. So Kathy asked, did the darker colored sand indicate ash? Yes. Oh, I guess I didn't actually specifically say that. <laughs> yes. So that's, that's why I played the fire video. Um, the, the fire is bringing in all this nutrients. All the plants have, you know, well, they fall into a few different types of strategies of how they deal with fire. And the little, the little part of the video that I played was on the re-sprouters, the plants that look like they're dead, but they're not really, they just pop right back up from the ground. But then there's also reseeders, and those ones die off, but then their, their seed bank is out there. Um, and for both of those strategies, they both seem to like fire because um, it stimulates new growth. And you'll see with uh, saw palmettos, here I've got a little, some little, little, saw, little saw palmetto here that um, even though they, um, you know, they get, looks like they get burned up. Oh, I just saw a coach whip. Oh, okay, hold on. Um, even though it looks like they get burned off, they pop back and start growing again in just a, just a few weeks. Pretty amazing. And then they flower after a fire. Um, and if it's been years since a fire, they don't flower nearly as much. So some of, the, some of the plants take advantage of having nutrients and having less competition because everything got burnt. Um, and then other ones, they just, they put their stock in having underground growth. The fire knocks out everything above ground and then they just pop right back up. Um, okay, this is my first time seeing a coach whip out here. And I can't show it to you because it just went into a burrow. I could show you the burrow, but oh man, I was walking and just boom, it flew in there. I'm going to turn this around. Whenever I'm out walking around and giving tours, we always see all kinds of little burrows and people say, oh, you know, what is that? Is that a snake hole? What, you know, what is that? Um, and I always say, well, keep in mind, sorry, let me turn this back around. I would say keep in mind that the, the snakes aren't making these themselves. Something else made it. Um, but yeah, there could definitely be a snake in there. Uh, if you've never heard of a coach whip, beautiful, big, big snake, a non-venomous snake. Um, Google it later. Very exciting. All right, Cheryl said, you said the water was not scrub. What is that area called? That's a, well, people were putting out different names for it. Around here, people call them seasonal ponds in Florida, but we have guests on from around the U.S., so you might have heard them called uh, ephemeral ponds or vernal pools, and that all means the same thing, which is just that they're not there the whole year. They're ephemeral, or um, vernal, what does that mean, springtime, I guess? Yeah. Um, or seasonal, you know, they're only there for the season. So if you went back to that same spot uh, in the middle, well, just a couple months ago, before the rain started hitting, it would have been dry. Some of them can be um, almost totally dry in the winter. And then you come back like later in the rainy season here, like say, uh, say the beginning of August, and poof, we just have hundreds of ponds all over the place out here. And some of them can get, you know, can get pretty deep. Um, Next week, here's another good plug. So next Tuesday, I will be at a, one that we call a seasonal pond, but it actually is there year round, but the water level goes way up and down throughout the year. Probably it'll be about my stomach, which is pretty deep for a pond out here. Um, and depending on where you are in the country, I know the word pond uh, means different things. Being originally from New York, 
um, what I would think of as a pond, people in Florida would call a lake. So when we say a pond in Florida, we're referring to very small thing. Uh, generally, it's to little seasonal ponds that they're talking about. All right, going along with the pond theme, what types of frogs are there in the ephemeral ponds? Uh, well, actually, while we were walking, I just saw a toad. You know, the toads don't live in the water, but they're, they're ta when they were tadpoles, they did. And it was an oak toad. I love the oak toads. They're very small. They're the smallest toad in, uh, in the United States. And I thought about trying to run over and grab it and, and show you on the camera, but I didn't. Uh, they're pretty cool. There's, uh, oh gosh, what do we have? Oh, I don't know, all kinds, of, all kinds of frogs. If you come out at night, oh man, you hear them all going crazy out here. There's the you know, barking frogs. Uh, actually, a few weeks ago, one of our researchers did a talk on the history of frog and toad research at Archbold. It's on our YouTube page. I, for, I forget what the name of the seminar was. Um, it's a great talk. She played all these clips so you can hear the different types of frogs. Uh, oh, somebody mentioned southern toads. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, we've got southern toads out here, too. Oh, okay. I know we're supposed to do Q&A, but I found something very cool. So I'm going to show you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put my... Um, I want to put this back on too. Now I have to be a little bit careful. So there's an insect here called the devil rider walking stick. And that's kind of a scary name. Uh, it's black with, with yellow and, and orangish red stripe on it. Uh, what's interesting about this one is there's only one. Usually you see two of them called devil riders because the male is smaller and it rides on the back of the female. I'm not sure if this one's a male or a female. I think maybe it's a female, but it looks kind of small. Uh, I'm gonna switch this around so you can see. The reason that I have to be a little bit careful, see if we can get that in focus with the light there. Can you all see that? It looks like it's out of focus to me. And I get a little closer. Um, the reason I have to be a little bit careful is that these can spray. I'm going to put my magnifying lens on. These can spray um, a pretty nasty liquid to defend themselves. Here we go. And they can shoot, I think it's about like 10 inches or so. They have, they have these special ducts right behind their head, uh, one on each side. And it um, really hurts. <laughs> I've been sprayed once and it hurt. They shoot you directly in the eyes. <laughs> they shoot you directly in the eyes. The females are bigger and they've got more. Um, and you basically temporarily just kind of go blind. You can't open your eyes. They just hurt a lot and you're crying. And uh, I've picked many of them up, but you gotta be careful. And, when it happened to me, I had a group of fourth graders for a field trip, and I was holding it, and I said, oh, you know, you got to be respectful, and as long as I'm real gentle, it's not going <laughs> to sprayed me in the face. <laughs> and one of the kids got sprayed, too, so then we were both running back to the learning center to wash our eyes out. Uh, I'm going to put down, I'm going to listen for the next question, but I'm going to try to catch this well, uh, while I listen for it. Oh, and Dustin, put your question? glasses on first. Um, oh, let's see. Fine. Anne asks, could you transplant scrub plants to your yard if you have a very sandy yard? Um, oh, that's a good question. Uh, yes and no. Some of them are pretty hard. I've, I've tried with, with different kinds over the years. And um, you, what you want to do is find a native plant nursery you can go to the uh, Native Plant Society website. There's also another website for FAN, the Florida Association of Native Nurseries. Um, and it's, the, it's the, the website that I really like is the Florida Native Plant Society one because you can put on there the type of yard that you have and what you're looking for. Do you want plants that are, that are there because they're pretty? Do you want ones for pollinators, ones for fruit? 
um, and you put it right in there and it'll give you a list for your part of Florida. Uh, awesome website. And going to a native plant nursery is really fun. All the people that work there are very knowledgeable. Um, and yeah, I highly recommend it. And, oh, and you don't have to worry about things like, um, well, one, you have to worry about invasive, getting an invasive species. But sometimes when you get flowers from a big box store, they've used different kinds of chemicals on them. And then if you have caterpillars on those plants, it might kill those caterpillars. I know that's been a problem in the past. I heard recently that, I don't want to drop any names, but that one of the stores corrected that and it's not a problem anymore. Um, but the native nurseries are awesome. Uh, can you see our little friend here? He's right, I don't know if it's focusing on him. He's right here. Here, I'm gonna, I'll put my lens on here again. Now he should be a lot easier to see where he is now. move. Oh, he's hopped up on a little blueberry. Okay. All right, buddy. I'm bringing my camera. Oh, my lens is, my camera is hitting the plant. Oh, there we go. Okay. There he is, or her. Beautiful. When you think of a walking stick bug, you know, you think of something camouflaged, but this one is not camouflaged at all. It doesn't have to be. It went with a different survival strategy with having that chemical. So instead of camouflage, it has bright danger colors, just like a monarch butterfly has those same colors on it to let you know, do not mess with me or something's going to happen. This one will spray you. A monarch, uh, because it feeds on toxic milkweeds, um, is toxic to eat for birds, too. Cool. Okay. Oh, I'm glad that worked out. Um, I could take, a, I could take, how about one more? I don't know. Is, are there still a bunch more questions or no? There are just a few more. By the way, that lens is fantastic. Everyone's really enjoying that. <laughs> so too. let's see. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I could do a couple more. Um, but please feel free if you're, if you're on the video chat, don't feel like you have to stay on. I know we're past our regular limit, um, but I love being able to talk with you. So I'm going to stay on a little longer. Yeah. And also, if we don't make it to your questions today, we will send out a follow-up email. So if we've missed your questions somewhere, I'm trying to look at Facebook and, and the chat here and everything. But if we've missed something, we'll get to you via email at least. So Dustin, let's see. We have a question from Bob on how do you deal with exotic invasive plants? We, we, have, um, we have some staff people and volunteers. So if you do live in this area, or actually really any area, people, nonprofits always need volunteers. All of them do. And the amount of work it takes to try to get rid of invasive species is, I don't know, it's, it's like a never ending, really. So having a, a whole... Um, you know, force a whole army of volunteers to remove invasives is really helpful. Um, depending on the species, you do different things. You might be just pulling them up. You might be spraying them. Uh, we do both. Fire, you know, is a really important tool out here, and fire can help with that as well. There's, um, you know, we have our own volunteer group here, but there's another one in the area run by the state called the Ridge Rangers. And I highly recommend uh, looking up the Ridge Rangers. In fact, even though they're only in this part of the state, uh, they mostly do work in Highlands and Polk County, um, they have volunteers that drive from the coast. And they will put out an email blast saying, hey, uh, next Saturday, we're going to be at this state park, and we're going to be removing this invasive species. And 10 people will show up, and they'll spend a few hours out there pulling up a ton of whatever, you know, in the tall grass or whatever, you know, whatever the species is. They also, um, if you have skills with a chainsaw, they do a lot of chainsawing because this habitat, if it's not burned, can get overgrown with sand pines. Sand pines are native, I mean, they're not invasive, um, but if you wanna burn again, it's too dangerous to burn with all those sand pines there. So you cut them down 
with a chainsaw, leave them on the ground for a bit, and then you burn. And volunteers do a lot of that work too. Not, not usually the burning part, but cutting down the trees. Yeah, good question. Yep. All right, here's a serious question from Duke. Do the seasonal ponds support hydrophytic vegetation? Are the sandy soils poorly drained in those areas? When you walk in, in there, you're seeing a whole bunch of different plants. And one of the things that's fun about it is depending on where you are in the pond, depending on how deep the water is, you have different plant communities there. So you have the ones that love the water, they can be real deep, and then you have the other ones that you only see on the edges of the pond. Um, and so even on just a little five minute walk on this trail right here, I can walk through several of those different zones of plants, the water loving ones and the water um, and the ones that can't get wet, like these scrub ones around me right here. Excellent. And Ren has to know, have you ever seen a panther? I have seen one panther, but it wasn't in Florida. It was in Western Canada. So I don't know if you count that or not. It's the same species, but we have our own subspecies out here, a Florida panther. I've seen them, uh, you know, at uh, animal rescue places, at zoos, uh, but they, man, they're tough to see. Um, if you've seen one, in the, write it in the chat, because I, I mean, people who have spent their lives out here, um, you know, have seen them. If you live further south than I do, I'm kind of in South Florida, but if you're down further south of Lake Okeechobee, that's where there's a lot of panthers, and the people down there uh, definitely see panthers. In this part of Florida and, and, and north of here, there are some, um, but not that many. I would love, love to see one. Um, <laughs> the overall number for panthers right now, oh gosh, I'm trying to remember what the state said. You know, they don't know exactly, but I think they said like 150 or something like that. Um, please, someone correct me in the chat if I'm getting that wrong. Um, there has now been breeding uh, near this area, near Archbold, which is the first time that they've had a record of that in like 35 years or something. And that was just a couple of years ago. So that's really exciting. The Panthers have made a huge comeback the last couple of decades. That's really exciting, but they keep getting hit by cars. I mean, that just every year, just oh, over and over again, keep getting hit by cars. And when we build roads, uh, we have to take into consideration how it's affecting wildlife. These animals like bears and Panthers, they, they're traveling hundreds of miles and they've been doing it for you know thousands and thousands of years, and all of a sudden there's a big highway there. Uh, it's going to kill them, right? Some of them are going to die. One thing that Florida is doing, which is really good, is they are putting underpasses in. They're putting wildlife crossings, so uh, the the panthers and bears, alligators use them. Deer they can walk right under the highway. We need more of those. But when they put them in they work the animals use them it takes them a little while to get used to it but they use them so what cool and rare animals have you seen out here well if i kept walking further down this trail this trail is called the j trail because at archbold we have an endangered species of bird called the florida scrub jay and um if you were on the field trip we did a few weeks ago in the rosemary bald a family of scrub jays popped out right there and they were squawking at me. This is uh, breeding season, so I, my guess is that they were kind of like, hey, what are you doing here? Get out of here. Uh, but the scrub jay, it looks a little bit like a blue jay. It's only found in the Florida scrub habitat, it's only in Florida. It's pretty cool. Um, even rarer than that though, I mean, so, let me just back up a second. So they're endangered only in the scrub, but there's still a lot of places you can go to see them. There's a lot of different parks. If you want to see a scrub jay, it's not that hard. What is incredibly difficult that I have seen um, several times are Florida grasshopper sparrows. That's one of the most endangered birds in all of North America. They're incredibly hard to find, um, but I'm fortunate enough that my, my wife is one of the biologists that studies them. They only live in this part of Florida in the northern Everglades. Um, 
they don't look like a little stuff, but have stiff habitat environments. They live in the Florida dry prairie, and uh, their numbers started plummeting. I don't know, it was 10 years ago or 15 years ago. I forget exactly. They were listed as in, on, on the endangered species list in the 80s, but then there was another huge drop more recently. So right now, the big news is the last few years, there's been captive breeding. So some of the birds were captured from the wild and then brought you know, to a, um, an endangered species breeding facility. They've been breeding them for the last several years and they've started reintroducing them. So that's a really big deal. And um, they have, uh, some of them have stuck around. I'm not sure if they've shown any breeding yet, but some of them are still around. Uh, a couple of them have flown hundreds of miles back to the breeding facility in, in, that's in North Florida, <laughs> which is amazing for a little sparrow that's not supposed to go very far. Okay. <laughs> wow. All right, we have a couple of questions about snakes. I'm gonna put them together. Uh, Ellen asked, what is one of the most common snakes in the scrub? And Bill asked, do you see indigo snakes? Yes, I have seen an indigo snake. I don't know if common is the right word. Uh, that's a, that's a, I don't forget if it's endangered or threatened, but it's a federally protected species. And this part of Florida is you know, a great place for them. They're, they they uh, will go in the gopher tortoise burrows here. Uh, we've had them right even near the learning center before. We've done some research on them here um, and done some survey work uh, at the Avon Park Air Force Range uh, which is an hour or so north of here, and they've got them up there. For common snakes, what I always see are black racers. You know, that's not nine out of ten times I see a snake is a is a black racer, and they're non venomous. Sometimes they end up in the learning center, getting stuck in the learning center, and I've got to catch them and put them back outside. There are venomous snakes in Florida. I have seen um, a coral snake a couple of times. Um, uh, here at Archbolt. And the good thing about those is they're not aggressive, really, at all, pretty much at all. They're, they could kill you if they chewed on you. Um, that's how they in inject their venom, but they just, they just slither away. All right, that's about it. Thank you Thank so you much, everybody. everybody. Bye. All right, everybody. That was so much fun, Dustin. Thank you. So I just want to have a couple more announcements and I will say join us again next Tuesday to visit the seasonal pond like Dustin talked about. That'll be Tuesday at 9.30 a.m. And then Dustin talked a lot about the photography seminar already. You stole my thunder but it's Thursday at 3.30 p.m. and three of our staffers will present conservation photography techniques. So thanks again, everybody for coming. I hope you enjoyed it and have a great day.